Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what we're calling Session 7, um, Disability Inclusion, a Driver of Long-Term Value Creation. Our webinar today, sponsored by the Harkin Institute, Goal 17 Partners, and Global Goals Advisory. I'm Meryl Friedman. I'm going to do some brief introductory remarks, um, and then we're going to jump in. Uh, I am the Regional Vice President at Anthem for Inclusive Policy and Advocacy, and I have had the incredible um, opportunity and pleasure of moderating several of these panels throughout the year. Uh, so for those of you who have been able to join us, um, hopefully you are going to keep coming back, even though this is where we wrap, but I'm trying to convince everybody to keep doing more. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. I have, which is part of our approach to inclusive webinars. As you notice, we have closed captioning and ASL interpreters. If you have any uh, difficulties with accessing the accommodations or need any support, please do let us know, put it in the chat and we will get to you um, and get those responded to very quickly. I um, am a white appearing uh, woman. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I have short, curly, all salty, no more pepper anymore, really, hair. I'm wearing a black v-neck shirt. I'm in my home office where I feel like I have been for 20 months and um, just still thrilled to be here today. So thank you. I uh, self-identify as a person with a disability, a little more on the neurodivergent side with ADHD. Welcome again. Um, we are so glad you're with us coming right up on the holidays. Um, and let's just take a moment to take into consideration the destructive weather systems um, that are uh, running through the middle of the country. We are grateful for your safety and your participation. Um, so let's hope uh, everybody remains safe throughout the rest of the year. Each of the panel sessions that we posted throughout 2021 have focused on solutions that permanently impact, influence, and formatively change systems so that people with disabilities are fully integrated into companies at every level. That means equal pay, equal recognition, equal responsibility. Um, equity is where we're heading. So the genesis for the conversation, for all of these conversations has been a white paper that the Harkin Institute sponsored with Goal 17 Partners that was titled Solving Then What? Empowering Investors to Achieve Competitive Integrated Employment for People with Disabilities. Today, we're gonna to focus on the important insight in solving then what? Companies that foster diverse and inclusive cultures create more value and outright outperform their peers across the marketplace. Um, and they do it in the right approach. So long-term value creation is much more than profits and share price. Uh, it's about those opportunities to enter new markets, reach more consumers, create products that make positive changes in society using the business models that solve some of the world's largest problems. And that's inequity, right? That's a lack of access. Um, and that's the disproportionate number of people with disabilities that are unemployed or underemployed. And companies that actually appreciate the importance of an inclusive culture maximize the talents of the workforce um, and are considered on the front edge of innovation. Um, and I think, you know, that's what we do and we leverage, you know, people's various experiences and identities. So considering innovations like audiobooks, cruise controls and vehicles, which I still can't figure out, keyboards on your computer, segues, Alexa, uh, she's probably listening right now, voice activated, you know, dictation on iPhones. These are all technologies that are brought about um, through supporting people with disabilities, but including people with disabilities in the creation of the technology that best works for them. Um, and so we're gonna aim for, what we're aiming for, right, is that continued press, right, to meet the human needs while solving societal changes. And we do that by including what I often refer to myself as a humanoid. Right? When we bring people into the discussion uh, and into processes at equitable levels, making room at that proverbial table, the virtual table these days. So it's no accident that some of these most successful and inventive companies across the world, Intel, Microsoft, Unilever, right, just naming a few, place the premium on creating inclusive cultures and understanding disability is just a typical part of life. We all encounter it at some point. Um, across the lifespan of the companies know how to leverage the talents of their entire workforce, no matter the backgrounds, and most importantly, embracing the diversity of people's experiences. However, unfortunately, not every company, right, appreciates those benefits of an inclusive culture yet. Um, and that's why we're here, right? One of the surveys I've checked out 
um, when I was reading through some notes over the weekend is that uh, one of them said that more than 75% of consumers and employees said in a survey that they're more likely to buy from or work for a company that stands up for ESG principles. So there's a movement to be had here. So we are glad you're joining us uh, to continue the discussion. So today we're going to hear from several experts. We're going to introduce them next um, on you know, three key principles, tangible steps companies take to foster inclusive cultures, how inclusive culture leads to long-term creation, and how to measure the outcomes achieved by an inclusive culture to ensure it's integrated into the long-term strategy of the organization. So here we go. Rachel, I'm going to start by introducing you. Rachel is the Senior Consultant in AON's Corporate Governance and Environment Social and Governance Consulting Practice. Prior to joining AON, Rachel directed ESG research for an impact investment firm and worked in the ESG ratings industry since 2007 at ISS and MSCI. And I know I shouldn't use acronyms, but I honestly do not know what the acronym is. <laughs> ISS and MSCI break down too, so I'll embarrass myself and put my naivete out there. Uh, Rachel has experience across sectors with ESG areas of focus on circular economy, human capital management, diversity and inclusion, and environmental risk. And uh, Rachel has also provided ESG advisory services throughout the Middle East, Africa, and Northern America. So we're all hoping to get that travel bug in action uh, as soon as we can uh, get through COVID. Tracy. Uh, Tracy is known as a truly authentic leader throughout her career. I will vouch for that. I have known Tracy for well over a decade, and um, she, she is a rock star. Tracy marries her lived experience, you know, business savvy, HR knowledge, strategic diversity, management ex expertise to guide women, leaders, and organizations through their leadership and diversity journeys. Uh, after Tracy, Left Anthem, where I still am, uh, she created and she is the owner of TJE Coaching and Consulting uh, and launched her second career, um, one that is amazing and embraces and her, with through her leadership, everything about authenticity um, and inclusion and diversity and focuses on her passions as an executive coach and diversity, equity and inclusion consultant. Tracy teaches her framework for mastering authenticity as the driver to creating successful career teams and organizations. Um, I think one of Tracy's you know, great strengths is she is extremely direct, um, but all of that directness right, comes from a place of authenticity and it helps guide companies to a better place and people uh, to be able to lead that within their company. So Tracy, I'm so glad to be back uh, on the speaker circuit here with you. Uh, Caroline. Caroline is a people first business strategist, organization and culture designer, and diversity, equity, and belonging practitioner. I love that. Her specialty is transformational level change initiatives, inclusive of technology and culture, and she serves both nonprofits and corporate entities. Currently, Caroline serves as the senior director of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Sarepta, a biotech uh, company in Boston serving the rare disease community. Caroline's proudly disabled and credits her lived experience as a patient is the best possible credential for designing equitable, inclusive organizations for all. I totally agree. Um, so this is our fabulous panel. We're gonna kick off. I'm gonna get, um, jump us right in. Jump us, that's good English. I'll do better as we uh, get going here. Um, right into the questions, um, but please, this is totally interactive. The first time you speak, please do um, a description of yourself so that everybody has a, a better view, if you will, uh, on who we are and our incredible panel. So jumping in, we're going to talk about fostering inclusive, equitable organizations. During our prep talks, we even talked about um, people first and identity first language, how we can you know, level things up and ensure that we are working and communicating um, and serving through cultural humility. Uh, and so a lot of today's discussion, right, is going to be focused on what are those tools to foster inclusive cultures, right? And how do we measure the progress so that we know we are moving forward? So Tracy, I'm going to start with you. Um, in one of our prior panels, um, a prior discussion, Rose Kirk of Horizon um, shared a really powerful thought that too often everyone talks about all the stats that when you have a more inclusive leadership team, businesses do better, right? We used to talk about that together. Mm -hmm. We still do differently, but no one's making decisions on those facts. People are blocking action because they are not comfortable with it. So you have to get underneath it and find what makes you uncomfortable if you're going to change. 
So tell us, uh, share a little bit from your perspective, you, how you coach others. What does it mean to get uncomfortable so you can foster a more inclusive culture? Um, thank you, Meryl, for, for the kind introduction. Let me just uh, give a little bit about myself. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I identify, self-identify as having a disability. I am proudly living successfully with anxiety and depression every day. Uh, that is a part of my journey and my story and who I am. I'm an African-American woman with tightly coiled uh, little Afro on my head. And if I was bold enough as Meryl, I would be salt and pepper, but I have dyed it red. So um, that should give you the picture. I tr I'm trying to look a little sassy as I approach um, my birthday this, this Saturday, I'll be 55. So that should give you a good impression, a uh, good idea of who I am. Um, you know, this is, this is a great question because especially in the wake of what we've seen over the past couple of years in terms of political polarization around issues um, from race and, and all kinds of things that shouldn't have been polarized, George Floyd's murder, many, many organizations are jumping into this conversation about diversity because we do know there's plenty of data to show and demonstrate this, that when we have a more diverse board a more diverse leadership team, we see greater bottom line impact. So why aren't more organizations getting after it, right? Because it's so uncomfortable. Diversity is a head and heart conversation. And when we talk about the head, the data, we can clearly understand and see the connections. You know, it makes total sense. But when you talk about the heart, there's a lot of emotion that's tied to understanding why we haven't moved the dial in this space. So when you're in the majority and you are a leader and you have an opportunity to make a difference, what happens is you have to face some really scary things, both maybe about your leadership, maybe about the systems in your organization, and maybe about the culture in your organization. So as leaders, you know, we want to show up as if we know it all, but this is a place where no one knows it all. No one knows it all. So when I'm working with organizations, what's really, really important is that the leader understand their own diversity story. And believe it or not, white men on this call, you do have one. And so really tapping into what that is, as well as understanding deeply the diversity story of your organization. So when you take a look at your organization, um, not just from a representation perspective, but how our process is established, how are we talking about uh, difference, disability, for example, in the organization. So that's very, very scary. But what I always advise folks is, because we know there's a business connection, let's take this from a business perspective. If we had a problem in the supply chain and it was impacting our customers, we would go deep on what is going wrong. What is the impact to the customer? We would talk to people about how are our processes functioning inside and out of the organization. We would delve into root cause. We need to take the same action when it comes to diversity and inclusion. We need to step in, dig deeply into it, and see what we can do to make it better. If we come to that with an open heart and an open mind and a sense of curiosity and, and good intentions, then we're able to make difference. So we have to face that scary um, head on. That's the only way to do it. So it's completely uncomfortable. No one likes to be told that they're not doing a great job at something, right? But if we put that in the context of bottom line impact to the business, and we solve for that, just like we solve for a business issue, it can make a world of difference. Yeah, it is so true. And how many times, Tracy, thank you. You know, have we heard one, thank you for sharing your story and your journey um, with anxiety. Uh, it's so important for people to continue to, to see leaders um, sharing their story. It's what we, you know, we, we talk about. So thank you for doing that. Um, but, you know, we hear so often now, you know, that it's okay to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be uncomfortable. Get comfortable with being mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Absolutely. So, I mean, it, it is so right. Um, so taking that, um, and I, I will probably want to come back to that because we really want to give people tools, right? And, and those how to. So we're going to come back to a lot of that. But but Carolyn, I want to come to you for a minute and, and being able to leverage, you know, and, and build on what Tracy has shared here. 
What are the lessons you've learned um, in designing and building equitable organizations, right? Helping to give um, feedback and, and guidance to companies. Thank you. Um, I am one, I am a huge fan of discomfort. So I am delighted to have this question and delighted to build on Tracy, um, but I will start with a personal description. Um, so my name is Caroline by you, I use she or they pronouns. Um, I, um, I can sum up my appearance right now by saying I am very corporate. Um, I actually have put on makeup and blow dried my hair. I am in the office today. Um, so this is like a one in 365 chance that you've got this today because of a holiday party. Um, I am 40-ish, um, short brown hair, blue eyes. Um, behind me is um, very well-painted walls and a, a, a TV. Um, and I am wearing a, a very geometric black and white um, striped top, um, as well as wearing a headset. Um, I also identify as um, disabled. I um, live with a congenital or uh, from birth spinal cord disorder, uh, PTSD from pediatric medical trauma. And as a pandemic, because it took a pandemic, also diagnosed um, ADHD um, last year. Um, so definitely uh, bring uh, multiple different disability hats um, when thinking about these conversations. Um, so when it comes to um, building on discomfort, what does this look like in organizations? Um, I want to give a big echo to everything Tracy said that includes everyone has a diversity identity. When we narrow it to just race or just gender, we are totally um, just not thinking about like, are you a veteran? Are you new to this industry? Are you early in your career? Um, there are like the number of um, constellations of different diversity identities we have um, is near endless when we think about personal, um, environmental, organizational. Um, and the one thing I'll add to the discomfort in my experience that it has helped is recognizing that discomfort cannot exist without also having a cycle of grace. Um, and I say that as someone who is not great at grace, I am a very direct communicator. I'm very implementation oriented. But um, to me, the idea of, um, yes, we need to give direct feedback and we need to get uncomfortable and get comfortable with discomfort, but we also need to give each other forgiveness and create a psychologically safe environment where learning is possible. Um, if you've never used pronouns before and you misgender someone, um, you're never going to do that again if the feedback you get from your colleague is, I can't believe Believe you misgendered them um, versus, hey, let's use this as an opportunity for learning. Um, or if you um, want to get more in the disability conversation and refer to someone as being differently abled or handy capable, and someone says, hey, um, many disabled people are speaking as a disabled person. Um, I really prefer disability first language. Um, leading with curiosity and both creating discomfort, but leading through discomfort um, with trust in the best and intentions. Um, to me, um, that cycle um, I find is really helpful. Um, and the other thing I'll say um, in top lessons is this is never ending. Like the idea of just like, check, like I'm great with discomfort. I can add that to my list of skills. Like I am on top of it. Um, this like, it doesn't go away. And part of the reason it doesn't go away is because there are infinite number of combinations of diversity identities. So like, let's start with saying disability a hundred times out loud until that feels more comfortable. Um, maybe um, you are becoming an anti-racist organization. That is a different level of discomfort. Um, maybe you are delving into pay equity and what that looks like in your journey to become an equitable organization. So all of those are discomforting for different reasons. Maybe it is exposing your organization to risk. Maybe it is a new thing to you personally. Um, but think about it like going to the gym and flexing some muscle or whatever it is. It's like, it is exercise and we're not going to get better at it if we don't commit to consistently learning, consistently giving each other feedback. So true. And I love the fact, <laughs> thank you for sharing your story um, and, and for your words thus far, you know, and I think it, it gets us to this point where you were talking about grace. I had to learn a very hard lesson in this, you know, um, in the company because I was, I was not looking at these opportunities as learning opportunities, right? When people would um, not use people's pronouns or would use, you know, cutesy terms like, you know, handy capable, you know, and things like that, right? You know, and I, I had to really transform my approach 
to creating safe space and learning opportunities to bring people along because it changes, right? We evolve for people who identify as LGBTQ, you know, plus, I mean, the language changes, the references change, right? Understanding people first for our, versus identity first and really just starting to, you know, build that space to, to talk to people and get to know people, right? And then ask them, this should be based on a person's, pre a person's preference. Somebody, you know, that's Sean. Hi, Sean. Sorry, I missed our call the other day. I'm glad you got to meet our team. Um, you know, <laughs> for first, we refer to as, you know, a person with a disability, right? Some people, you know, very much, you know, say the word, I'm disabled, identity first. So this is really important to get to know people, and it's evolving and iterative. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so we're going to jump around and go over to Rachel here for a minute. So as we talked about, right, we, we want to move the needle. In doing so, we need to be able to measure, are we moving the needle on what it looks like? And you don't know if you're, you know, fostering inclusive, equitable organizations, and if you're succeeding, how, you know, if you're doing that, and how you're doing that, and how do we measure that progress? Thank you, Meryl. And it's really a pleasure to be on this panel um, with you, Meryl, and Tracy, and Caroline. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I identify as she, her, hers, and as an ally. And I have to say that this is my first experience um, bridging really my personal and um, professional spheres. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, and really, you know, in the past seven years, my husband, he had a stroke seven years ago, um, really workplace rejection <laughs> and training has been very personal supporting, um, supporting Jeremy, my husband. So, so with that um, measuring, let me start with the fact that one in four people in the US are disabled, according to the Center for Disease Control. And I think that's, that's an important statistic for us to you know, really keep in mind. Um, you know, as, and as Tracy said, you know, how are we talking about diversity and inclusion? So, you know, collecting diverse workforce demographics, um, you know, uncomfortable to comfortable. It's really essential to this conversation. Um, how can we measure and collect data internally at the workplace? Um, and really, this isn't about singling people out around disabilities. This is about supporting. Um, it's about a culture of openness and transparency um, to get from that uncomfortable you know, to comfortable. Uh, so what I would offer is let's look through uh, the lens of talent engagement, retention, recruitment. Um, companies like Intel and Twitter who have very earnest conversations um, and have been looking into this for a while, embrace, embrace best practices you know, for welcoming people with disabilities in their workforce. And just some statistics, by the way, Meryl, um, ISS is Institutional Shareholder Services and MSCI, <laughs> Morgan Stanley Capital International, big data, um, you know, uh, proxy advisor, ISS, MSCI indexes, um, and talk about uncomfortable to comfortable. I'm in data all the time. Never been real comfortable with it, but that's that's my world, and I've always every day. <laughs> we all we all have to get uncomfortable with data to get comfortable, and because it's so critical to the conversation, you know. Um, and so, to return to the workforce, um, people with disabilities in the workforce are four times more likely, um, you know, or companies are four, are four times more likely to have shareholder returns. Um, and outperform their peers, just to give you some data, um, and are really better positioned to tap into the disability market. Um, 1.3 billion people um, with 1.2 trillion in annual disposable income, and this is according to the National Organization on Disability. Um, that's a big market. So let's look about inside the company. I would say with this lens of talent engagement, retention, recruitment, really starts with manager training and how to support employees. Again, changing the culture to ensure openness and transparency. Um, how do you provide accommodations? Making these conversations accessible and routine. You know, this should be the norm. It's not right now, overall, comprehensively. Um, really training HR professionals on how to accommodate when onboarding and remind that disabilities are all-encompassing. Employees that have experienced cancer, chronic illness, neurodivergence, you know, strokes. Um, you know, from mental, cognitive, physical impairments, we need to think more broadly on how to accommodate and recruit. This is all about measuring, still about measuring, you know, um, tapping into disability and resource groups, business resource groups, offering career resource pages for people with disabilities that offer accommodations to apply. You, you got to measure on the way in, right? You need to have accessibility and openness, have a career page um, that really accommodates those with disabilities so that they even know how to 
you know, what they can do that's accessible to apply. Um, and let's get real with this conversation that, and, and thankfully we really are, do, you know, our panelists really are grounded in this. Um, you know, not only are people with disabilities more compassionate, they're resilient, patient, problem solvers, right? More creative and innovative because every day waking up is hard. Every day waking up is really hard work and they have to live in a society that doesn't necessarily accommodate or understand their challenges. And as an ally, I see this every day. So really, you know, improving retention, recruiting, it's also, you know, a direct result of a more inclusive culture. Um, campuses have disability resource centers. We talk about um, with diversity inclusion overall, tapping into historically black colleges. You know, this is part of the conversation. Also tap into disability resource centers at campuses. Supplier diversity, you know, a conversation around procurement of vendors is really critical to support underrepresented minorities. Um, disability in, National Organization on Disability, ADA rights just celebrated the 31st anniversary of American with Disabilities Act, you know? So, you know, talent engagement, recruitment and retention of people with disabilities is really part of this measurement and recognizing that an open culture is a catalyst to collecting the data and really having a conversation around uh, disability inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, uh, for sharing your story. And we're glad you're with us, kind of combining that personal and professional now. So uh, thank you for, for you know, joining us uh, in this sphere. Um, we have made a lot of progress. Uh, we did celebrate and recognize the 31st anniversary of the ADA. We've got Olmstead, we've got Medicaid and Medicare. You know, we have you know, moving forward, even in the diversity, uh, using that term little d right here with an even commercial insurance um, so that everything's not in Medicaid and Medicare for people with disabilities. Um, and that's important to companies. Companies need to um, actually have strong um, insurance benefits, health benefits for people with disabilities right to be employed um, and not face disincentives and experience disincentives uh, based on that. So, I think there's lots to be unpacked, um, you know, going forward. But in our limited time here, um, a couple of things, if we start to look at how do we get right to a better place, you know, a, a, an inclusive culture, you know, recognizing um, equity within companies, you know, what are these best practices, right? You brought up um, BRDs, Business Resource Groups, Associate Resource Groups. You know, once again, Tracy has had to hear me talk about, you know, are they really the right approach? Are they not? Some companies are, are doing away with them, right? And are not finding we're addressing intersectionality, um, allyship. So there are lots of pieces from a culture perspective, right, around DNI to a practice perspective. And if we look at uh, Caroline, I'm going to come your way with this next question as uh, so a little bit of a heads up. But when we look at the early days of the pandemic in the wake of George Floyd's murder, and virtually every company committed some kind of effort um, around fostering diversity and inclusion, um, you know, embracing social justice discussions, addressing you know, racism and becoming an anti-racist uh, uh, organization. But, and we're still having those, um, those conversations, but not all companies are still having those conversations. And this is how we get into right conversations around systemic racism, ableism, and ageism and paternalism, right? Because the conversations tend to stop after some type of an acute event. So how do you grade these efforts? Is progress being made? Are we going to sustain change? Ooh, um, so I will do what I can to scratch the surface of this epic question um, and please others um, weigh in. So my high level thoughts are, yes, we've absolutely made progress and we should celebrate that. There are conversations happening at work and in individual workplaces and across workplaces that have not happened as publicly before. That is centering mental health, that is centering mm -hmm. the needs of caregivers. And I would say to a lesser extent, but interrelated centering the needs of people with disabilities. To me, the major failing of this has been the future of work consultants have said it would be so, and now it is so. But the reality is mothers, black women, 
the disability community has been championing this for decades. Um, and I'm going to acknowledge that I am passionate about this and you can hear it in my voice. Um, there's also an irony because I am both to a certain extent a disability activist and a future of work consultant um, too. So I feel like I'm like kind of this bridge between worlds, but um, to me, it comes down to it is sustainable when you are listening to what your people want and listening to all of your people and creating a culture what is psychological where it is psychologically safe to give candid feedback about your needs wants and desires as employees your employees always know this ceases to become sustainable when it's what are the future of work consultants saying about the direction of work um are we since um it, the the arbory trial could have gone the other way that could have been another George Floyd in terms of what was happening in the world. Um, and much to the detriment of humanity, I do expect we will see that again. Um, and I'm not happy about that, but to me doing the day by day for inclusion, for equity, for belonging, um, and what that looks like for intersectional identities and intersectional allyship that is being curious, that is getting uncomfortable, that is um, leading through grace. To me, those are the drumbeats of the the day to day um, where this becomes sustainable. Um, so in short, are we making progress? Yes absolutely and i want to uphold that and i want to celebrate that workers have more agency largely if you are a knowledge-based worker who can work from home which is not everyone it is not um I, that is me and i do not represent everyone um however um in terms of where are we getting our information from and who are we centering, um, I really think um, we have not made as many gains as we need to in that um, to truly harness um, what there is to be harnessed of, of centering equity um, at work and um, diverse workplaces, whether that be um, a retail chain, um, a global think tank, um, et cetera. So before we let you go, <laughs> if you were to pick one, like like when you say we're like we're not like harnessing, like we're starting to, what is one thing? What's the first thing off the top of your head saying that we're not doing now that we should be doing? The thing, I know it's not just one thing, but yeah. So I think the thing we're not doing that we need to do is we're still thinking it's going to go back. There's still, I think they're still thinking, like, I don't think we've fully um, appreciated that maybe it's pandemic, maybe it's something else. The world will continue to change faster than we can control because of technology, because globalization. So to think that we should spend our time going back to how it used to be versus let's listen to what the people know about their needs, their wants, their changing environments. I think that is the one thing that if we um, could shift our perspective and our framework, um, we would be light years ahead and thinking about um, strategic growth, people-centered organizations, things like that. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you for letting me like put you on the spot there for one more. Um, so we're gonna, uh, Rachel, uh, let's uh, sort of build off of that, shift a little bit as we, as we do. Um, that's what happens when you do have moderators that identify as having ADHD, it's always an adventure, um, <laughs> but, Talk to us, if you will, um, from your lens on, you know, why, how investors are positioned to play such an important role in helping companies accelerate their efforts to be more diverse and inclusive, specifically for this conversation, right, for people with disabilities, but from an intersectional perspective, because as people with disabilities, we also identify, you know, as um, LGBTQ, we are also black, brown, um, and identify as AIAN. So we're, you know, the, we are we are intersectional, probably the most intersectional um, group of, of people. So if you could talk to us a little bit on, on that position um, for influencing that investors have. Thank you, Meryl. Yes, quite the, it's a, it's a, it's a complex question only because um, it's, it's new really. So board accountability, and oversight has been on uh, issue investors have really been paying attention to for, for about a decade. BlackRock, State Street, we've got some leaders there, right, pushing. 
Um, but including diversity into this board oversight conversation is nascent, right? It's accelerated um, over the past few years, uh, summer of 2020, murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, you know, Ahmed Arbery, and the race equity movement really promulgated this laser focus of understanding that, wait, this is about our community and much of our community is a total intersection into the workplace. You got to bring your whole self to work. And so, you know, and investors are now starting to bring disability inclusion into this diversity conversation uh, slowly, really. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing more of a focus on workforce diversity and disclosure demographics around EO1 data. And actually just hot off the presses, BlackRock just released its uh, investment stewardship proxy voting guidelines. And this is the very first time that I've ever seen uh, language, including people with disabilities and board composition expectations. Now it's a footnote, it's on page six, <laughs> um, but it's essentially reflecting, <laughs> we'll, we'll take it, you know, it's a, it's a beginning, right? Um, yeah. It's basically reflecting EO1 data and saying as part of this board composition expert expectation of the underrepresented minority, um, people with disabilities are included there along with all of the other groups, you know, with the intersectionality that you're talking about. This is effective as of January, 2022. Um, expect other investors to follow. Um, I know this conversation is, is starting, you know, social investment forum, you know, in, in various places. Um, but, you know, now we do have investors talking about the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion in their prospectus, in their interviews, in their mm -hmm. voting policies. Um, there's, you know, there's clearly a business case. We've made it already. Uh, you know, there's a shareholder prerogative and there's a moral case. Um, and remember, one in four people are living with a disability. You know, all of us, you know, chronic illnesses, neurodivergence, I think we forget ourselves, you know, in this conversation of self-disclosing. And, and it's a hard conversation, you know, and, and as an ally, I, you know, I can speak to this too. You know, there are lots of agencies companies can work with, vocational rehabilitation. There, there are so many opportunities, um, you know, for people to stop being rejected in the workplace and start being empowered. And, you know, in seven years, you know, my husband is still pre-work, right? Because yeah. the resources just aren't there. And so, you know, investors are starting to see because investors are people <laughs> and we are this and we are interconnected. And so everybody knows someone with a disability, um, you know, so have this conversation within your company, recognize that investors are paying attention and how are you defining disability and inclusivity? Mm -hmm. How is your leadership addressing this and break down the stigma? Yes, breaking down, increasing acceptance, right? That's that's it. We're all all sort of moving through, and I do think the pandemic, as many warts as it has opened up, and as much grief as it has created um, for so many people, and the impact it has had, sort of writ large across the globe. One of the things that has come of it, and it's been mentioned and alluded to already, is this opportunity to really talk about mental health disabilities in the greater schema of the, the disability conversation. And we talk about it very openly, these conversations about race, mental health disabilities, and others haven't typically um, taken place in many companies. So I think there is opportunity here, right? We are on that front. We just need to keep it out, right? You know, our disability pride uh, rises um, to the top for many of us. And so I think it's, you know, helping other people uh, navigate their own disability identity in the workplace also helps, right? Because it's at all levels of the company and should be. Um, so Tracy, um, you kind of we kind of went around and about, um, but uh, you are you're up next here, and we've had some questions already too. And how do we reach? Like we got a question from Michelle, and how do you reach leaders who don't recognize the importance of disability inclusion as part of diversity? Right, and we always say if you're not if you're talking about diversity and you're not talking about disability, then you're not talking about diversity, you're not talking about inclusion. So you have the opportunity uh, to get in front of lots of execs um, around um, mm -hmm. these conversations. What advice are you giving them? Um, what actions uh, should they be taking? Are you advising them to take? And what are those that have like, are gonna yield the most, like the most potential, potential where we can you know, track some real significant progress? No pressure. Right, <laughs> right, and no pressure when I'm working with these executives. You know, right. um, the first piece of advice that I have when I get the opportunity to work with executives on this is to start where you are. And what I mean by that is understand 
where you are in your knowledge as a leader in the organization about diversity, inclusion, disability, race, intersectionality, all of those components. And then do the work to understand where the organization is. Because we can talk about lots of different things that can be implemented. For example, there was some conversation about resource groups. Well, it'd be really, really hard to launch a resource group for people with disabilities if you haven't gone through the conversation on self-identifying, why it's important, what it means to the organization. And so many um, leaders are looking for the quick answer. You know, they're reacting to this moment in time that we're in, and they don't want to be on the wrong side of this diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging conversation. So they're like, give me this, give me that, give me this. But you have to really start with where you're at. There's three things that I always um, talk with leaders about. One is connecting this conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion to who you are as an organization. It has to be connected to mission, vision, values. Absolutely, at the end of the day. This is not something we're doing on the side. This is not something we're kicking around with. This is about our organization, our entire organization, each and every one of us and how we identify. So that's really important. The second thing is create a plan. Start from where you're at, create a plan. What are you going to do to not just change the culture, not just have conversation, but make systemic change, process change. The last thing is accountability. Making sure that this is a conversation, not just being had at the water cooler or the virtual water cooler anymore, or um, in a pocket of your organization, but it's being had at the board level, it's being had at the executive leadership team level, and it's being it pushed down through leaders in the organization. So those are the, the basic principles the things that I see that have the most potential is process change. Because here's the thing, the processes that have been created today, and, and Rachel alluded to this, when we talk about like the talent management process, when we talk about the hiring, the development, the retention of talent, those processes have typically been developed by the majority. And as such, there's a lens that's placed on that that creates them in a way that does not always work for everyone. And so we have an opportunity to make true systemic change by including everyone in the development of those policies, procedures, and processes in the organization. The folks that I work with who make those systemic changes are the ones that have the most sustainable outcomes. We have to change how we think about things and then how we do things we have to normalize some of these conversations. You know, um, one of the things that, that, I think is really important, and it kind of got touched on here, was <clears throat> you know, how do we create psychological safety for the difficult conversation? That's one of the most important things that leaders can do is to create that space, you know, so that we get the information we need about the differences, the value that it adds, and how to change processes to be sure that everyone can engage in them fully. You know, that is huge. And leaders have the power, absolutely have the power to direct how their organizations talk about things, direct how safe it is. They create that environment. So those are the things that I see really are sustainable when you get leaders engaged and when you change processes. So I, 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 uh, Okay. Well, sorry about the uh, echo. It sounds like we are have sounds like tigers roaring or lions roaring. Um, is the sound okay, or are other people hearing that? Okay, great. Thank you. So, Tracy, when you say that, and you know the journey or, or much of it that 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 I I live here, and and many other people on here, a couple of questions, and please, Rachel, Caroline, this is jump in here. This, this is the fun part, right? Where, where we get to talk over each other and, you know, really get to, to a robust conversation, but we want to build safe space, psychological safe space. We want to, you know, ensure that people know how to do that and then how to bring people with lived and personal experience into these discussions and using those resources to do it. How are you all advising senior leaders and executives to build safe space because
cause, that's a really long process, or it can be perceived as disingenuous and we don't make progress. So what are some tips? Like how do we bring um, the disability community and the black community and right our rural communities, like the LGBT community into these conversations to help open this up? And how do we really give executives, how do executives do that? How do we help them get to a better place? Well, I'll tell you what I've experienced um, and where I've seen it done well is leaders who are humble enough to know they don't know everything and are courageous enough to say that. I don't know everything, I want to learn. They come with a level of curiosity. Um, they come with open heart and open mind because we have to be willing to hear something that confronts our sensibilities, our beliefs, what we thought we knew. So there's a, a degree of humbleness there um, and a willingness also to own their diversity story and share it. It takes that kind of, of leader. Um, and I tell them all the time, you know, it's okay to be afraid. Um, courage is fear in action. So you cannot be courageous without fear. So you need to lean into that, be afraid, um, be courageous, share your story and remain curious, open heart, open mind. That is great. It's a good thing we have that, we're getting this transcribed. We gotta save that. Caroline, Rachel, please jump in. I can jump in for a minute. Um, you know, from my experience talking to companies, let's just take a look at the summer of 2020. It was, it was a very intense summer. The race equity movement brought surfaced issues that have been inherently institutionalized and racism and discrimination. And, you know, companies were scrambling and, and at that point, I was I had my different hat on representing institutional investors and talking to companies all summer. And and the best practices that I saw were the leaders, like Tracy's talking about leadership, having town halls, speaking openly and honestly about these conversations of race and discrimination, unconscious bias, um, and saying, you know, we are paying attention, we are open, and having smaller forums with executive leadership and really being honest with those conversations. What happened from there? Um, and this is why we're having the conversation now. I mean, we also have to understand that the pandemic has really unveiled access issues to healthcare, to childcare, to jobs, um, frontline workers who are the ones that were most exposed to COVID and why we have to ask those questions and be honest with them. Um, how is discrimination institutionalized? And so more programs and initiatives around diversity, equity, and inclusion have arisen um, many more hires of chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officers, it was tenfold. I'm sure there's a statistic out there about how, how many more people are being hired into companies. And so we talked about the employee resource groups. You know, that's the safe space that you're talking about, Meryl. Where do you lean in? Um, major companies have them, smaller SMEs, smaller medium enterprises, not, not so much. It's usually more in the nascent. So meeting where you are, that's the conversation we have too from Aon is, so where are you? And, you know, there's the practical approach and seeing what's happening. And then you have to get strategic and tactical, right? What are you going to do about it? You know, so culture ambassador programs, um, mentors that are from a diverse background that are um, in, in higher, more executive roles or any role that just they've been there for tenured for a while, uh, meeting with um, onboarding people from diverse backgrounds that, that are a match, LGBTQ plus or, you know, African-American or someone from a disability saying, hey, I'm here for you. This is hard. Um, contact me anytime and I'll help you navigate the organization, you know? And so having those peer mentor programs, having the employee, having the, leaning into the employee resource groups, business resource groups, and really um, getting uncomfortable and having those uncomfortable conversations from the executive leadership all throughout the company and organization. That's what creates safe spaces. It does, it, it does lead in. Caroline, I see you coming off mute. I, I just want to give a shout out, uh, if I may, before you start to a lot of our friends from the IL community that are working with Centers for Independent Living and, and they are fabulous resources. You are right. And thank you for putting that out there. Um, I think, you know, the National Council on Independent and Rama uh, being the, the, she's not new anymore necessarily, but the newest, uh, uh, executive director of Nickel and then the Centers for Independent Living, just being such an incredible resource um, for companies to rely on as well um, to give um, advice and feedback and help them, you know, talk about disability. 
Um, so. Yeah, second you. for uh, National Centers for Independent Living. I learned a lot about that through Crip Camp and the evolution of, of that. And um, it's, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, so high five. Um, the one thing I wanted to add as a nuance to that, and um, I, I want to amplify everything Tracy uh, and Rachel said at the same time, some leaders don't want to hear, be vulnerable, get uncomfortable. So sometimes as a flipped tool for that, I'm like, you're competitive. You love being the best. You want to be an outstanding manager. You know, being a great manager is important to retention. So if you want to be a great manager, something you can do more of is live more out loud. So like model things like, um, I need to leave early to pick up my kids. I'm taking Friday afternoon off because I need a mental health break. Um, I definitely believe that big things like the town halls really marking big events matters. Um, but since like the getting uncomfortable like isn't a message that lands with everyone, I find that an additional coaching tool can just be like, just live out loud a little more, like model what it means to be vulnerable, to like bring your whole self to work, uh, make it more actionable in small ways. So you think possibly that me telling my, you know, team all the time, like, take time, do what you need to, right? You know, take not as valuable as you actually like taking canceling the day. My PTO. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actions speak louder than words. You know? Go change that. I'm taking the afternoon off. No, um, so, uh. You know, I think that's great. I think living out loud, right? It is, it's, it's leadership, right? And casting that leadership shadow of authenticity, which is why we need people with disabilities in leadership roles, why we need, you know, um, people of color in leadership roles, right? We, we need representation. We need leadership shadow, right? We need that setting that example. It is so critically important. Um, so we're getting close. I always get sad about now, but trying to really watch the clock at the same time. And I want to make sure, right, we've dropped some great, great tools and resources and things that people can, can do, you know, and the, the role, right, of this, um, of investors, the role of companies and leaders, but the role of people with disabilities and people, with, you know, personal and lived experience to create this sort of seismic, you know, shift and change that we want to see. So it, if you had sort of that, you know, proverbial magic wand, and I don't want to be ethereal, you know, about this question, but those, those top nuggets of information that we can really provide resources, podcasts, tools, you know, what are those things that you give people that we can take away that, that the participants on that are with us today and others can take away and either create change in their organization, right? And, and help to make that happen for their leaders and for their, their peers and their colleagues and everybody else, or for people working in centers for independent living, community organizations, right? And, and consulting roles um, and things that they can do to sort of shake it up a bit too. Just open question, round robin here. Don't make me call y'all out. <laughs> um, I'll try and start. This is uh, slightly bigger than a nugget. I believe we have a ton to learn from the organizing movement of, of our LGBT brothers and sisters. And what I mean by that is um, a lot of people I know with chronic illness do not identify as disabled. And I don't expect them to change their identity at the same time when it comes to um, specifically what I mean is I've seen tremendous um, advancements in um, uh, gay individuals supporting trans folk in more um, intentional ways and making that a more holistic movement specifically around economic mobility um, when it looks like we as a um, as a culture these are the businesses we support because we know they are LGBT owned and operated um, that is really what I would love to see next for the disability um, movement is saying um, I um, I am someone for whom accessibility is something I'm learning about um, for example um, vision 
version in um, audio are not, um, that's not part, of something I need to think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but I'm really um, upping up my game to listen, to learn, to, to be more proactive, to include that in my disability inclusion practice and actively seek out um, people who are running those businesses. Um, that's, that's how I'm thinking about it for me personally um, in terms of um, widening my network and spending my dollars and, and really looking to the LGBT community um, for, for insights on what that looks like. Yeah, I think that is great. I think it's a great nugget. We can, <laughs> that's a big nugget. Um, but I think, I do think that's part of it. We got we to put big ideas out there, right? But we have to learn to break them down um, so that we can, you know, get to a better place and ladder up, you know, to, to uh, an area of success. But I, I do think that's great. Rachel or Tracy, either one of you want to tackle this one next? Nuggets and all? Asking questions. I really think we're, we're very much at that stage, Be really curious. internally. Um, right. And when we're talking about the workplace in specific, you know, human resources, I know. Um, so I asked a lot of questions when I was asked to be on this panel. So I talked to people internally here to get to get more resources. And I learned a few things such as, you know, um, human resources, you know, how I spoke a little bit about this, but how are they accommodating? And really, what does that mean? So Recently, we hired um, somebody at our organization, and I learned about this because we have a, a business resource group here. So that's a safe space to lean in, and I leaned into that group, right? Um, to ask these questions, someone came on board who was deaf, someone came on board who was blind. No idea how to accommodate, but the questions were asked, the accommodations were made, you know, you know, WebEx, <laughs> no way to interface. And so contacting Cisco and finding out how do we do that? And then we made it happen here at Aon, right? And so, um, but at every company, at every organization, small, large, those conversations need to, need to be happening. And the only way they're gonna happen is if we ask the right questions. And the other number two, what I'll say is that some people don't wanna self-disclose. They don't wanna bring their whole selves to work. You know, and I've talked to companies that have said, we've tried to start these resource groups, but you know, we have, we've put out a survey, people don't wanna do it. And I don't, you know, and so clearly there's more to dig in. Who are the people, you know what I mean? So everybody's different, right? And yes, maybe some people want to stay private or keep private, but that's, that's also, we talked about giving people grace. We're all in, everybody experiences grief in life, right? This is the great human equalizer. Everyone experiences loss, whether personal, familial, workplace, what have you. And so just kind of understanding and, and, and being sensitive to that as well, but still providing the toolkit in the workplace by asking these questions, by engaging human resources, by having these cultural ambassador programs, um, you know, starting with small focus groups. It doesn't have to be a business resource group or an employee resource group. Maybe some just gatherings, you know, um, from like-minded people and inviting even other people who want to be private about it and just seeing what happens and asking, asking those questions. Yeah, I think asking those questions is really important. And you brought up, and, and we're not going to be able to cover this. And I, I want to get Tracy's, you know, point there. But there's a, a real philosophical um, pause. You know, is it that people don't want to bring their whole selves to work? I I don't think that's the stopping place. But it's it's how do we get to the point that there is that safe space for them to do that, whether they self-disclose publicly or not or self-identify. Uh, so, you know, so I, I, I th that's a whole other webinar. Um, but uh, Tracy, I want to, I want to get your, your thoughts on this too, please. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. You know, um, I want to piggyback off of the, what both the ladies said, and especially Rachel, when she kind of touched on the resource groups. And I see we have a, a question kind of related to that. Um, and had a, you and I both have had a ton of experience with resource groups. And, and what I would say that one of the most powerful ways to establish that relationship between um, the organization and the resource group is through having the resource group be very connected to the business and what the business is doing um, in the community, within the organization, et cetera, using them as resources for how they can deliver better to their customers, how they can deliver better to their employees every day. That's a critical piece. And one of the things that I found most powerful, one of the most powerful experiences I had um, while at Anthem and working with resource groups was for the resource group to own a candid conversation about their group. And one of the greatest ones I attended was around the LGBTQ plus community and hearing them, trans individuals, gay individuals, talk about their experiences. 
-hmm. And when they owned that, they could speak about it in a way that none of us could who were not in that community. And having that opportunity to learn and they created a safe space for people who were not of that community to ask all the questions they wanted to. They created that environment. And so really giving them the opportunity to take a leadership role in creating psychological safety and in advancing the business is a great way to make change. I love that. And full disclosure, right? I am the executive sponsor of the Disability Inclusion Network, <laughs> BRG within Anthem. And we transitioned from associate resource groups to business resource groups mm -hmm. this year to do just that, to tie to the business. Yep. As usual, we are out of time. Um, I think y'all are awesome. Um, we could do this all day. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your expertise to our participants as well, to our entire community and your families. I want to uh, wish you all just a happy and healthy and possibly calm and relaxing, safe um, and, and joyous holiday season. Um, for some of us, our holidays already passed because it ended up really early. For everybody else, uh, we are allies. Um, I wish uh, a great thank you to uh, the Harkin Institute, Goal 17 Partners Global Goals Advisory, our ASL interpreter and our captioners, um, our panelists and participants. I bid you all farewell, happy new year, and thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.